Hi, this is Fred Green with episode number 101 of Golf Smarter Mulligans and part two of Taking Your Game to the Next Level One Club at a Time with the late Tony Manzoni. As this is the second year we're featuring our interviews with Tony, this is number four of nine in this consecutive series of replays that range from 2009 to 2018. Please go to golfsmarter.com slash Tony to learn as much as we've been able to find about him. And from what I've gathered, it's the most extensive offerings on Tony anywhere on the web. Thanks to his author, Paul Cervantes, the book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, is once again available on Amazon, both in paperback and Kindle version. And his DVD of the same name can now only be seen online through our private channel. To gain access, please write to me directly via email, golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, or just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. Enjoy. Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter Podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. You know, when you're in and around the green, which is a scoring area, whether you're pitching the ball on, you want to do it the simplest way, the way that even if you miss hit it, it doesn't become a catastrophe. When you start lifting that club up and bringing it down on the ball in a more steeper angle, the miss hit is going to be horrendous or you line drive it over the green into a lake or something like that. Or when you're using a more level to the ground stroke, if you hit a little bit thin or a little bit fat, it doesn't hurt you. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Well, I think that um, take this idea of taking your game to the next level one club at a time, um, which I suggested, but I, I do want to cover it, I think starting at the putter uh, is a great place to start with that. Um, so sure. I'm going to toss out these club names and give me a, 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 a thought or a tip on what you can do to take your game to the next level with that specific club. And let's start with the putter. Uh, you know, again, with the putter, what I teach, I teach people to hold the putter comfortably and, and any way they really want to hold it within reason. And, and I work on, I work on distance control, whether it's a five foot putt or a 20 foot putt or a 50 foot putt. Uh, I, I don't tell it, them to get it into a circle around the green. I tell them to try to roll it into the hole on all putts uh, because I think that's a natural uh, a feeling where you're saying, put it in a three foot circle. Now you bring it into another, another situation that you have to deal with. Um, so in, in putting, I, I'm teaching them to roll the ball. In fact, in fact, one of the great pros said, if I were going to teach putting today, and this is, this is the fellow that helped Jack Nicholas putt. Uh, he said, I would put somebody on a green with no holes. Uh, and I would teach him to, to roll the ball distances, teach him how to roll the ball and not, not hit it and skid it, but roll it. Um, and, and I believe that quite a bit. Hmm. So I actually want to go to a different club that I saw a video tip that you did that I've used ever since. And I'm going to go to the eight iron for using it around the fringe to get the ball onto the green. Using your eight iron yeah, as a putter. Uh, yeah, Paul Runyon was the was the first guy that really did this where he would take the put, take an eight iron or a seven iron or a five iron, or whatever, depending on the distance you had to cover. Uh, and he would take the heel of the club off the ground so that he could al get the shaft in the same alignment as your putter. Uh, and he put his hands on it uh, on the length. So in some cases, if you had a five iron, he'd slide his hands down near the metal, but it, so that he, he was replicating standing up with his putter uh, and then he used a putting type stroke. No, it's not exactly. The the club had to come up a little bit, but he used more of a, a one lever stroke opposed to cocking the wrist or doing anything like that. And the idea was is to find out how far on the green you had to land the ball and then let it release to the hole. So if you were up close, you'd be hitting 
an eight iron or nine iron or even maybe a pitching wedge. You, know, I, you wouldn't use this on a, with a sand wedge, it's too much loft. But that's a much simpler way to chip. Most people will pull out their sand wedge or pitching wedge and, and use it all around the green when they're chipping. I'm not talking about pitching the ball. I'm talking about chipping it. And, uh, and, and it's, that's a much more difficult shot, much more difficult. Yeah, it is. Um, I, when I was telling you that this 80 that I shot the other day, um, I only had, I had six one putts on the front nine. I was one over par after nine. Um, <laughs> I only had one birdie, but <laughs> so that means I was coming up short uh, on my approach shots, but I was getting it close to the hole. And a lot of times I've been using that eight iron chip. Um, and it's, it, once you learn to control that, once you feel comfortable with it, it's a great shot to have in your bag. Oh yeah. Because it, you know, when you're chipping, you're not trying to impart backspin. Uh, you want to re- the ball to release the hole and the quicker you can get it on the green, the better. Um, when you have a more lofted club, you have to lift the club a bit. Uh, and, and hit down on the ball a bit. And that brings you into a lot of areas of getting tight with the hands and either sculling it or hitting way behind it. They call it chili dip. Uh, but both of them are hideous, especially the skull. Like the guy oh. said one time, how far do you hit the ball? He says, well, I hit my, my sandwich about 150 yards. He says, really? He says, yeah, from a greenside bunker. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, 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 that happens. That happens with these clubs that are constructed that way. You have, you have to be a little bit more accurate in your stroke, where with a putting stroke, even if you hit it a little thin, it doesn't really affect anything. You know, The ball will roll just about the same as you did if you hit it pure. I've noticed a lot of people will take a lob wedge uh, or a high lofted club um, if they're 5, 10, 15 yards off the green. Well, let's just keep it at 10 yards off the green and in. Um, but they're trying to get the ball to land, land softly, and then trickle up. But isn't the goal, shouldn't you try to get the ball onto the flat surface as soon as possible and let it release, let it roll as long as it you know can? Or do you want to try to drop it absolutely. in there? No, no, absolutely. And when, you're, when you're doing those kinds of things, you, you've, got other, you've got grain to deal with. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you have a set, the, 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 the green goes up. Uh, or you'll have a second lever. Uh, your 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 target is w- way too small when you do those kinds of things. And sometimes you impart backspin on it where you pinch it a little bit and you get too much backspin. So you, you want to get all that out of there. You want to just get that ball on the green and let it release to the hole. It's just an easier shot. I mean, that, that's that's the bottom line because the nerves do the nerves do get uh, get in, especially if you got that ball on a little bit of tight grass. Uh, it's be- it's much better to take an eight or nine iron or seven iron and just putt chip it. It's so much simpler. Right. Is there a rule of thumb to how much a ball will release depending on which club that you use? Like if you're using the eight oh, iron sure. versus a pitching wedge uh, and you're just you're chipping it up on the green? Sure. Uh, I mean, it, let's just say that uh, if it, let's say we're going to land the ball a, a yard or two onto the green. Uh, if you land the ball a yard or two on the green with a seven iron, it's, the ball is going to release a lot farther than it does a nine iron, unless you're unless you're unless you're hitting it harder. But if you're consistent in your stroke, the the less loft you have, the more it's going to release. So so you don't. I mean, I don't just use the eight iron when I chip because if I have a if the pin's way back and I'm in the front of the green, I'll pro- I'll take a five iron and do the same thing because I know that my target is still going to be the where I want the ball to land is going to be the same as if it was an eight iron or a nine iron, but the ball is going to release farther because I have less, less loft. So it's, you know? it's really about it, where you want the ball to land and then you decide which club to use from there. Exactly. And, exactly. and how do you pick the area of where you want it to land? What are you looking for? For me, you know, for me, it's, Unless the pin is really, you know, I mean, the cup is real close. For me, it's about a couple of yards on the green, four or five feet, and then let it release. Uh, but again, my target might get a little closer to me um, if I'm if it's a short a short chip. 
But again, my target, my landing target is always close to me, opposed to if I had a sandwich or a lobwidge in my hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that just makes it easier. All right, now let's go back to um, <clears throat> let's go back to our wedges, back to this one club at a time. Um, let's go, I guess, with your lob wedge. If I carry, I carry a sixty degree, a fifty seven degree, uh, and then a fifty two, and a pitching wedge, which is what about a forty eight. So I carry, I like to carry a bunch of wedges with me as opposed to carrying a lot of hybrids or, or fairway woods. Um, so the lob wedge, um, what can you do? What will that help you do to get your game to the next level? And what you, should you be practicing which, with a high lofted club like that? Well, the lob wedge is, is strictly for hitting the ball high and soft. And so you, and it's a shot where you want to, you know, you're above the green or excuse me, below the green and you need to throw it up there, but you don't want it to release. That's what the lob wedge is for. You know, because of the loft, you can go at it with a little bit of speed, and the ball will just go higher. Uh, so, th and that's shots you should practice a lot uh, because there are times you need it. But I know so many people that overdo it when they have a, a much simpler shot uh, where it doesn't call for that kind of shot, but they still do it. In fact, Phil Mickelson is is one of the guys that does that. But you know, he's like a wizard. Um, but you can't. You yeah, let's not compare ourselves to, to what Phil Mickelson can do. Cause yeah, we'd... but you can't replicate. You know, even guys on tour can't do that. Yeah, exactly. So, but, you know, when you're in and around the green, which is the scoring area, whether you're pitching the ball on, you want to do it the simplest way, the way that even if you miss hit it, it doesn't become a catastrophe. When you start lifting that club up and bringing it down on the ball in a more steeper angle, it brings in the miss hit is going to be – it could be horrendous where you line drive it over the green into a lake or something like that, where when you're using a more level to the ground stroke, if you hit a little bit thin or a little bit fat, it, it, you don't lose, it doesn't hurt you. And that's, that's what I, when I play, uh, and, I, and even when I played well, um, after being around Paul Ryan and listening to him, my game improved dramatically even when I w would miss a lot of greens, I could get it up and down a lot easier than I had in the past because I was one of these guys that wore out my sand wedge. You know? Yeah, well, turning, uh, I think the best thing I ever heard about that was trying to turn three shots into two. Sure, sure. That, that's, that's the whole name of the game. Uh, and everybody misses greens. Everyone does. Uh, as I tell my boys, if you hit 10 balls, seven, seven of them better be with, with the short clubs, the scoring clubs. Because the, the, the driver, okay, yes, the driver, is, it's built for one thing, to get the ball in play with a fairly good distance. But it's not a, it's not a long drive club. As it's been, you know, television, that's all they talk about is, well, yeah, he hit that 400 yards and 350 and whatever. They don't tell you that the ground is hard as the highway, number one. That's how they said it. <laughs> So you get 400, 400 yards of roll. They don't tell you any of that stuff. But it's too much emphasis on that and not enough emphasis on, you know, distance control, taking the right club. Ken Ventura used to tell me, when you got a seven iron to the green, um, take a six iron out and hit it. You, you're going to be surprised because if you really, if you kept a chart of every time you hit a ball to the green, were you short or long, 90% of the time you're short. You're short. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, it, it was a, you know, and it was something I followed and it improved my game. I, I got the ball a lot closer to the hole by doing that. And he got that from Hogan. So, yeah. Club up, yeah, that's like just club up it. on your approach shots. No question. Uh, sure, like sure. <clears throat> when I'm yeah. talking about the, the three shots to two, if you're, you're, um, the point is you want to chip up to the green and get it close enough where you can one putt where I play with people. If you're pitching, doing a pick shot from 30 yards or 20 yards in, um, they're, if you get it on the green, they're like, Hey, great shot. It's like, I left myself a 35 foot putt. That's not a great shot. I mean, yeah, I'm on the green, but oh. big deal. I mean, the point was I yeah, wanted to get, I wanted to get within five feet of the, of the hole. Well, I'll give you a good example of that. I've got a lot of young boys that can hit it a long ways. Okay. And we, they'll get on a par five and 
they can reach it with a with a three wood in some cases. I mean, I, I mean, a, a power five that's like five fifty or five seventy five. And I tell them, look, the trajectory of that ball coming in is either gonna if you miss hit it, you're gonna get you're gonna bury it in the lip of the of the green side bunkers, or if it hits the green, it's going to the back of the green or maybe even over. So you're always gonna be looking at a forty or fifty foot putt that you've got to get down into. And a lot of times you three putt it, and now you say, God, I hit the green in two and I've made a five. Okay. It's much simpler if you can hit something up there in your scoring range, like 60, 70 yards. Now you can take your sand wedge and throw it up there, and you can get it close, and you're going to make a lot of birdies that way. But again, you hear that the announcers talk about these guys. Well, Bob, you know, he's, he's got a seven iron, it's 225 yards. And so, you know, these kids, that's what they're trying to do. It's just, it's, it's insane. Uh, I think that the broadcasters of golf, uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them have hurt the game so much because, first of all, we don't get the ball that the pros play with. Believe me when I tell you that. That ball is custom made to their swing. So hmm. they, they got a hot ball. And that's why that's why a guy like uh, um, the guy that won the, 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 the Masters, uh, he's got an eight iron out, and he's hitting it close to 200 yards. Come on. Sergio Garcia. Uh, I mean, yeah, Sergio. Come on. Uh, th- that's not possible unless that club is jacked up or the ball is jacked up. Interesting. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the reality of it. I mean, it's, it's, these, guys aren't, these guys aren't any stronger than Ben Hogan or guys like that. But the, but the ball and the club they're using, is, is, they're, they're juiced up. Mm-hmm. No question about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they seem to be talking about spending a whole lot more time talking about distance and how they boom it and not the wizardry of the short game. And I think that that these, you know, since the Tiger effect has come in and, and courses have gotten longer and longer and longer, uh, they're playing into, you know, by making the courses longer, you're just playing into their hands, make it tougher on the short game and let's see what they can do with it. Sure. Sure. I mean, when, when when they play some of these real tough courses in the New York area in the Midwest, uh, they don't tear them up. You don't see twenty under par or any of that kind no. of stuff. But they set the golf. They, the golf courses are set up for scoring. They get in there and they cross cut those fairways. The fairways are faster than some of the greens that the guys in the thirties and forties and fifties played on. And they they just get make the golf course fast, mm-hmm. and it's great for television because there's a zillion birdies and so forth. But what they've done is they've taken the shot making out of the game. Even the ball, you know, it's hard to move the ball left to right or right to left now, uh, purposely, I should say. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it's a shame. And I think it's a shame in a way because they've made a lot of great golf courses uh, that were tremendous courses to play. And they've kind of made them obsolete because of what they've done with the equipment. And the other thing that that kind of makes me crazy is they're customized these courses for a tournament that may happen once a year at best or once every five or six years. And so that means they're customizing the course for 0.0001 of the amount of golfers that are going to play that course. But it gets TV exposure. Oh, that's one of the things that irritates me more. You know, I, I, I have a lot of clients that belong to very posh golf courses. And these courses are all, everyone's looking to tr- get more members. So what do they do? Well, we've got to get a younger group. And, you know, the, the membership's uh, uh, three or $400,000. There's not too many young people that have that kind of money to throw around. But, the, but that's what they get in their head. So now they put a set of what they call their championship tees and they're so far back on the whole the average guy out there is a in in the late 60s and early 70s and they can't hit it out of their shadow so what are they doing you know instead of setting up tees that for your membership if you got a lot of guys that are 70 your up tees and and especially the ladies tees should should correspond to the the distance that they there those people hit the ball yeah so that they're in the game uh, you know, many years ago, I did the mixed team championship, and when we were figuring this thing out, we went, we looked at the tour averages of ladies and men, and the ladies needed a 75-yard advantage off the tee because we had to take in consideration the second shot. 
not just the first shot. Of course. So if a man, if the average guy hit it a, a drive an eight iron, we want, we wanted the same for the gals. You can't get it exact, but we want it to be close. You right. go on golf courses today, and you'll see the men's tees, and you see the ladies' tees maybe 10, 15 yards, maybe 20 yards forward. <laughs> That's just insane. Now you got these gals out there. She, they're beating driver three wood with no chance of getting near, and they're hitting five iron on the third shot on a par four. That takes the fun out of the game. And it's yeah. an unfair challenge. It's an unfair challenge. Well, I think that was that's, the whole point of uh, play it forward. Right? Exactly. If you want to get people back into the game, they've got to be able to – I'm not saying make the golf courses easy. I'm just saying make them fair for the, for the person that's playing. Right. Okay? And you can't do it exact, but you can do a lot better job that's being done. I can tell you that. And if, and if Joe Blow or his wife can – Every now and then, get it in the low 80s and, and hit a green in regulation. Changes everything in their mindset. But if it's if they're out there and they're shooting in the hundreds and it's arduous, they're not going to want to do this all the time. No. See? no. So it just takes it deflates everybody. You know, we all have an ego. Yeah. And let's not even call them the ladies' tees. Let's just call them the forward tees. Right. Yeah, the forward tees. Sure. Sure. You know, Ooh. it's like I I don't I don't like. Like I'm usually the long driver when when I'm playing with my group, but it doesn't mean I'm scoring better than anybody else. I can hit the ball farther, but not with my <laughs> irons as much. Um, and I think the whole point of play it forward is that, like the pros, you should have an eight iron or less um, for your second shot. So absolutely, you know, move it up. Let's just say you're a short hitter. Okay, so a short hitter, you should probably be hitting a a drive and maybe a a five iron rescue club or six iron rescue club. But when you can't reach the green in two on any par four, then you're hitting too far back. The, the tee isn't right for you. You've got to move up. And the golf courses, they, they talk about it all the time, but no one really scientifically goes on that golf course and measures the golf course out and, and then charts. Okay. This is where Mr. And Mrs. Jones are going to hit the golf ball. And then intelligently, put tees down and make those tees not afterthoughts. Make them actually a teen ground for Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And and I, t I promise you, if they would do that, uh, you'd see more people smiling when they came off the golf course hmm. instead of frustrating or just feeling like I'm old. Mm -hmm. I know in my own case, I was a very long hitter of the golf ball, not a big guy, but I always could really clock it. Now that I'm 8-0, uh, which I can't believe, but I am. Mm. Um, I can't hit it that far anymore. So, you know, my, my best drive is 230, 240, sometimes 250. Wow. wow. Um, <laughs> That's still pretty good. I still hit it out there pretty good for an old guy. But still, you know, when I go out and play with uh, my students, you know, I feel like I should put a taffeta dress on or something because – they're popping at 50, 60, 70 yards past me with no problem. Yeah, but well, you're the age of their great grandfather. <laughs> exactly. So, so if I can't, I can't compete with that because they're they're longer with their iron, they're longer with their wood. Come on. Uh, so I have to play up, and there's nothing wrong with that, for God's no. sake. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying. Uh, instead of building championship tees to bring more people at your golf course, set your golf course up so people can play it. It's still a challenge, but if you have a good day, you get a good score. Mm -hmm. But some people, even when they have a good day, they, they can't get a good score because of the distance factor. You know, it, 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 very, it really upsets me, especially for the gals. Uh, they, 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 honestly, I think they're, they're, no one wants to say it, but they're kind of an afterthought when they come to the designing of the golf course or the placing of the tease and so forth they're just an afterthought and it's it's wrong it really is hmm. yeah um oh i had a thought no i lost it i was gonna say something about that. well we were talking about yeah. i get it's me i get on tangents oh it's, um, we both do we don't <laughs> <laughs> we both the do. Club. Oh, no, I don't remember what I was going to say is that how many times I've played with gentlemen who are in their 70s um, who can't hit the ball more than 150 yards except they're playing bogey golf because they hit it dead straight and they can putt. You know, so it's not about the big hitters. Well, Just keep it in the fairway and get in the close. No, no, there's no question about it. But those people, too, play a lot of golf and, and, uh, and either they're blessed or they practice their short game a lot. But, I mean, the average... Lady and man, 
don't put that much time into practice. They'll take a lesson here or there. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I'm an advocate of, 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 of not, not, it isn't so much a play it up, but to set the golf course up to accommodate what your general membership is, not, not the, the one guy that clocks it or not the one guy that can't hit it a hundred yards, but that middle range group. And you'd make your golf course, make everybody happier. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, the way they set the tour up, uh, it's the opposite of that. It's all, it's all predicated on distance. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, Tony? Um, we have so many more clubs that I'd like to cover about, you know, taking that to the next level, like the sand wedge, your long irons, your hybrids, your fairway drivers or fairway metals or fairway woods, whatever you want to call them, and your driver. So can we do, uh, as we have done many times, can we do part two of this uh, for next week's episode? Sure. I'd love, I'd love to. Uh, you got to put a muzzle on me at times because. <laughs> no, I, no. Instead been, of the muzzle, I'm just going to let you go life. longer. <laughs> We're just going to go on longer. That's all. All right. So um, that's great. We're going to do part two on this and continue this conversation of how you can take your game to the next level one club at a time with Tony Manzoni. Um, Tony, thanks so much for your cooperation on this. It's always my pleasure.